My name's Richard, and today I'm going to be talking about our paper, The Fast and Accurate Emulation of the SDO HMI Pipeline with Uncertainty Quantification. Our paper aims to estimate the solar magnetic field. Now, the reason the solar magnetic field is important is that different configurations of it can lead to dangerous solar flares and coronal mass ejections, and, and generally space weather that can injure astronauts, damage satellites, and cause communication disasters. So if we can predict and understand what this magnetic field is, that would be great. Now, when we look at the sun normally, we don't necessarily see too much in the visible spectrum. However, it turns out there's a lot that's going on across many different wavelengths of light. And uh, by looking outside of the visible spectrum, we can get a better understanding of what the magnetic field is. So we have a satellite called the Solar Dynamics Observatory, SDO, with an imager called the Helioseismic and Magnetic Imager that can record the sun's surface in a high resolution. And the reason it can use various different wavelengths of light to understand the magnetic field is something called the Zeeman effect. So the Zeeman effect basically says that light emitted that passes through or is emitted in a strong magnetic field will have its spectra shifted. So here we can see an example spectra for light and this might have been emitted in a very low field strength region. However, if you dial up the field strength, you'll see that the spectra has gotten shifted slightly and if you dial it up more, you'll see it got shifted even more. So We've, by using this effect, one can basically understand the magnetic field of the sun by only just measuring light that has passed through that field and had its spectra shifted. So the HMI imager does that. And what it does is it measures this IQ, U, and V differently polarized light at six different wavelengths or band passes to collect enough information that we may be able to figure out the magnetic field just from these measurements of light. So this creates, like I said, this 24 dimensional image with a 4096 height and width. And we can use these as our inputs for figuring out what the magnetic field is. However, uh, we don't have a simple method that can just go straight from IQ UV light to the underlying magnetic, sorry, the underlying magnetic field, at least not yet. So currently how this works is that there's something called the Milne Eddington generative model. And what it does is if you set a series of parameters shown here, including a magnetic field vector, kinematic and thermodynamic parameters, you can get an estimation of what the IQ UVs should be for those settings. So for a given pixel, we basically have a given output IQ UV for those parameters. Now, we can use this to understand how the given, like to reverse this arrow, okay? We can do that. And that's what's currently done with something called the very fast inversion of the Stokes vector, okay? Now, how this works is it chooses a set of initial values, models what IQ UVs they should have produced, and then measures the error against what was really observed and iteratively optimizes this. So this iterative optimization has been able to flip and reverse the error, sorry, the arrow, not the error, the arrow, but unfortunately, it doesn't let us do it simply and quickly, and it can take up to 30 minutes um, and be computationally ex expensive. So we replace this, and this is going to be our contribution here, is that we pr propose a system that can emulate this, but very quickly on the order of seconds. Uh, and all it does is it uses a feed-forward neural network system instead of some iterative optimization um, to go the other way. So. The data that we use is collected or downloaded from JSOC. It comes from the satellite, like I mentioned. And training data comes from the first 60% of 20, 2015. And test data comes from various sections of 2016. The method uh, is a simple UNET, uh, not changed significantly. Um, and it was originally developed for biomedical segmentation, but it consists of this encoder, which might encode information about the various IQ UVs, the 24 dimensions at, at resolution. And then uh, a decoder, which will turn this into some magnetic field parameter. Um, and then how this happens is actually quite interesting and um, worth it explaining clearly. So like I said, we have this neural network. Uh, it's going to produce predictions, which I'm showing on the right. Uh, and it needs to learn from a ground truth data set that has historical VFISV outputs from previously, because this is an emulation of this slower existing system. So how to do this? Um, you know, let's look at a single example, for example, the velocity of the line of sight of the plasma. Uh, we might have a value of minus 104,000 centimeters per second, okay? And 
we need to produce a prediction that can capture the full range of this value, so from minus 700,000 to plus 700,000. And we could use regression so that the network would produce a single value, and we would project this value that would typically be between minus 1 and 1 to minus 700,000 and plus 700,000. However, we're not going to do this because the data has an interesting skewness about it. Instead, we're going to use classification. So we're going to do regression via classification. Now, one naive way you could do this is you might say, OK, I have my value, minus 104,000. I'm going to go look at the neighboring bins, assuming I've split up the whole range from minus 700,000 to plus 700,000 into bins. And I can just round to the nearest bin and create a binary one-hot encoding of the value at that bin. However, uh, and, and then I could train with the negative log likelihood loss uh, f with my neural network. But we don't do this. Instead, what our method does is we create an expectation ac across the neighboring two bins that as the expected value is the real value that was returned by is v. Then when our neural network makes a prediction and assigns probability mass to various bins, we just run a KL divergence uh, between the, that expectation that we, were, we constructed and our predictions. And this actually leads to really good results, as I will show later. So uh, the other cool thing here is that we can use we can produce a confidence interval when we do this. So basically, if the network was very sure that it was two bins, it might assign all of the probability to one or two bins. But if it was unsure, it would leave probability around to help minimize the loss, the KL divergence that it, that it in, induced when we compared. So we can understand how confident the network is, which, if you remember, the long title is another part of the title. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about results. Here is a ground truth v phys v output of field strength for the sun from a certain time. And we have it ranging from 0 to 2,000 mx per centimeter squared. Now, our prediction looks very similar. So ground truth, prediction, ground truth. It's very hard to see the difference, uh, at least on the full disk. So we can zoom in. We see here our prediction, a ground truth, prediction, ground truth. And then we can use a difference map to understand that we're sort of our predictions under predicting slightly the active region, except for this sort of line that exists down the middle. Now, um, that's, that's cool. Uh, and we can do the same for various other targets. So that was field strength. This is inclination. We can see prediction, ground truth, difference map. And then we can also do azimuth angle. And so we can see prediction, ground truth, a difference map. Um, and what's cool about azimuth angle is that we actually do better in this active region than the surrounding low strength field strength regions, um, uh, which, which is exciting because it wasn't the case for both inclination and field. So finally, we can do one more with velocity of the line of sight plasma magnitude, where we have prediction and ground truth. Um, and then ground and then basically it looks very similar all the way down until we can break out the difference map and see that we're over predicting in this one area here. Um, so what I've done, and here are the final parameters, is show a, a couple of qualitative results that highlight how this system works. But I think it gets even more interesting when we get quantitative because we'll see how this methodology has actually really enabled high uh, accurate performance. So we can plot a correlation, or sorry, we can plot the prediction versus the ground truth for field strength. So a perfect prediction would be, or a perfect plot would have like a line that just goes through y equals x. And we can kind of see this happens because many of the pixels are near zero. Um, and th so we do follow this line closely. However, we can look at the log histogram to understand how the more rare data occurs. And then we start to see our first flaw. So for example, the uh, Prediction saturates at around 2750 mx per centimeter squared. And so basically, the network at this point doesn't see a lot of high values frequently in the data set. And it's just sort of binning many of the high values as, a, as occurring as just up in this upper region. Um, overall, though, the average error is less than 10 mx per centimeter squared. And that's actually one sixth of a single bin. So if you remember from this classification technique where we created this expectation, Making this expectation has let us produce error that is that is sub bin uh, error. So it's it's actually much better than the uh, just having a binary one hot encoding. Um, we can look at the same outputs for inclination. Here you can see that many of the pixels are well predicted near ninety degrees, 
When we do the log histogram again, you can see that things generally follow this y equals x line. But what actually is quite interesting is that although they do deviate in certain areas, they don't really deviate in the wrong direction. So a prediction that's on one ninth side of 90 degrees also is typically related to a ground truth on the same side of 90 degrees. Uh, then we can also look at this for high field areas, and you can see they fit well to line y equals x. Um, and overall, the average error is 0.5 degrees. So um, basically, the inclination angle ranges from 0 to 180 degrees. And on average, our error is less than 1 degree in predicting this angle of the magnetic field vector. Uh, finally, we can look at the velocity of line of sight magnitude plasma. And we can see a very strong correlation uh, in the row at the top. But also, we can see uh, average error that is quite small, given the range goes from minus 700,000 to plus 700,000 and a strong fit to y equals x. So uh, those were some qualitative quantitative results. And I have a full table here. We actually divide up um, the measurements of this average error into on disk values, plage regions, active regions, and greater than 100 Gauss. So by doing that, uh, we can understand where our error is. And so overall across the disk, we can see pretty low error, but we do do worse in active regions. Um, here it can show that what I mentioned earlier, the azimuth measurements and predictions actually improve if, as you go to stronger field strength, whereas the other ones degrade as you go to stronger field strengths. Um, an uncertainty analysis is the basically the last part of this. And what this is going to, I'm just going to show you here is if I, if you remember the confidence intervals that I talked about, we have an upper bound confidence interval, we have a ground truth value, and then we have a lower bound. And so what we want is we want the ground truth to always be between both the upper bound and the lower bound. Um, and you can see generally that this is the case where these things where these values that are above 180 degrees have an upper bound above the ground truth, which is noted in the green, and values that are below 180 have a lower bound uh, that is redder than the ground truth, which is shown here. Um, and there's more about that in, in the paper, but I'm going to skip it for the sake of time. So here we have an uncertainty analysis. This is basically, you can see this 90% confidence interval size. Um, and the size of the confidence interval stays relatively small until we get to these high field regions, which if you remember, we don't necessarily do that great on. Um, the, inc the size of this confidence interval for inclination also is really interesting because it's small near 90 degrees, but it's large both far as you go further and further away in either direction. Line of sight velocity magnitude uh, is similarly small until the, the edges of the prediction ranges. And azimuth is interesting because it, it has a very uh, wide confidence interval across all of the degrees, which I think reflects the fact that there's a lot of noise and azimuth angle in the low field strength regions of the disk. Then finally, I'm going to get to the goal and the best result of this paper, which is that VFISB currently produces unphysical aberrations that have a 24 hour periodicity. So this curve that shows the average deviation from 90 degrees of VFISV over the course of a day doesn't look too particularly concerning until you look across two days and you see that it replicates this 24 hour pattern in its measurement of something that is supposed to be solar, which generally shouldn't have the 24 hour pattern. Now, this is called colloquially cat ears. And it can actually be observed over the course of days so uh, and, and for the entirety of, of the data set. Um, and what we find is that our model emulates this process. Now, this is really cool because people have wanted to debug this issue with vFISV, but they have been unable to because it takes so long, 30 minutes, to do this iterative optimization. So the whole sort of one of the cool contributions here is that we've created a system that, because it emulates this existing vFISV, can be used to debug it and improve it, um, and and generally, like, solve other issues including biases. So, I want to just thank uh, the workshop for the invitation, and hopefully my system or our system can be used to debug some of these problems in vFISV, and uh, be useful to the solar space weather community. Thank you.